There was a line in that song that we just heard that said that he will fight our battles for us. Mark Batterson, who spoke here not long ago, he made this statement uh, in a book that he wrote recently. And he said this, that when we pray that God will fight our battles for us. It helps us to get a, a picture of and a glimpse of how vitally important prayer really is. My dad always said that nothing of eternal significance is ever accomplished apart from prayer. And so when we as human beings, when we go through difficult moments in life, when we as Christians are facing great challenge, great trials, great tribulations, it is important that the first thing that we do, not the last thing that we do, but the first thing that we do is that we make sure that we become people of prayer. And before today I, I move into uh, our sermon message for today, I do just want to encourage you, uh, all of the students, obviously, as Jerry mentioned a few moments ago, and uh, as we pray together today, you know, there, there is some, obviously, some heavy hearts, and we understand that, but I just want to encourage you today to always remember to continue to pray for Jerry, uh, my brother, your chancellor here at Liberty. None of us understand, none of us have any idea, any uh, any idea whatsoever of what it's like to lead an organization this large with so many different things that are happening, so many different issues, so many different challenges that, that we go through as a university. And I would just encourage you as he leads us and as he leads us in an amazing way, does an incredible job in leading this university, always remember to pray for him. It, obviously pray for him in the good times, th those are important. But also pray for him in the difficult times like today. Because it's a tough thing to lead when you're going through crisis. And so I just encourage you and I ask you uh, selfishly, not only as a pastor, but selfishly as a brother, that you would pray for him as he leads us in the days ahead and throughout the rest of history for this university, uh, that God would give him the wisdom, the guidance that he needs to do the right thing at the right, right time for this university, for all of us, so that this university will always stand as a testament as a testimony, as a witness of what God can do when people pray. And so I just ask you to do that if you would. Today I want to spend some time talking about some important elements, talking about the greatest aspirations in life. Now in today's culture and the way that we live today and what we see today, what we experience today, when asked the question, what are the three greatest aspirations in life? In today's culture, most people would answer in three, these three ways. They would say, well, fame is important. It's important to be known. It's important to be, uh, to be well known, well liked. It's important for everybody around to know who you are, that, that fame is an aspiration that we should all seek. We live in a celebrity culture. You can walk into any grocery store and as you come to the, the checkout line, the, the, the line is full of magazines. It's all about celebrities and, and where they shop today and, and where they bought a smoothie yesterday, and what coffee shop they like to go to and, and what uh, clothes they're wearing or in many cases, what clothes they're not wearing, uh, as in the case of Miley Cyrus lately. We, <laughs> we know that we live in a celebrity culture where everything is about who we are. And so when asked the question, the three greatest aspirations, the first would be fame. Another answer that people would ask and that would give that, when asked that question of what are the three greatest aspirations would be power. That people want to be powerful, that they want people to, to serve them, that they want people to actually help them and to do things for them. And so they want power, they want to be somebody, they want to make sure that, that they are able to rule, that they are in charge, that they're an authority. The third, and I think you could figure this one out if asked the three greatest aspirations, the third would be money. The people want to be rich. The people want to have all the cash they could ever need. They want to be able to buy whatever it is that they want. They want to be able to do whatever they want to do and never have to worry about money again. Anybody here feel that way? Wouldn't that be great to have all the money that you could ever want and never have to worry about a thing again? Those are the three greatest aspirations that the world would say that we should try to aspire to. The problem is, is that the Bible gives us a totally different picture. Now we're coming here in the university to the end of a semester that's pretty close. In fact, uh, in a couple of days, you guys are gonna be heading home for Thanksgiving, getting away for a week, which is a great thing. <laughs> then you'll come back from Thanksgiving and you only got a couple of weeks left until the semester is over and you get to go home for like five weeks, which is pretty cool. 
Now, some of you here today, when, when this semester ends in December, that's it. You guys are graduating. You're out of here. You're done. We are coming to the end. And when you come to the end, you start thinking about things that, that kind of really matter, that it's not really the end, that for us, it's really kind of the beginning. That we actually get, have to begin start thinking about, okay, what does tomorrow look like? Uh, what am I going to do next semester for those of you who are graduating? For those of you who graduate in May, what am I going to do in June? Uh, for those of you who are freshmen and you got a few years left, you will still be asking the question, okay, what am I going to study? What do I want to do when I graduate? Where is it that I want to go? Today, when we talk about the three greatest aspirations, what I want to share with you, according to the Word of God, is not what the world says is important, but rather what God says is important. And we find it in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. The scripture is given a very clear statement here that we, that we understand. And I know you know this passage. It says, no, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Three great aspirations, to do what is right, The Hebrew word there is the Hebrew word mishpat, which is the idea of justice, of what is right, what is just, what is the the correct thing to do in every situation. To do what is right, to love mercy, the Hebrew word hasid, which is the idea of goodness and, and kindness, faithfulness, of making sure that you are responding the right way in every situation. The last one, to walk humbly with your God of making sure that in every situation that we walk with humility. Now, when you look at these three aspirations that are found in Micah chapter six, you quickly see the difference between what the world says are the three great aspirations, power, fame, money. But what does God say? God says, do what is right and to love mercy and to walk humbly in humility with your your God. You can see the the dichotomy there, the, the difference there between those two trains of thought. The problem is when we ask ourselves the question, what do we really want to accomplish? What are the three great things that we need to do? When you look at Micah chapter six, verse eight, I think all of us in this room would say, yeah, you know, that's what I want to be. I I want to do that. I I want to be that kind of a person. The problem is hearing it and saying you want to do it and actually pulling it off are are two different things. It's a totally different mindset here. Actually being able to do what it is that that this passage says. And so today, what I want to kind of spend a few moments talking about is how we can do this in today's world, of how we can pull this off in a culture that tells us to do exactly the opposite of what Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says. So the question, how can we do it in today's world? The answer is quite simply, is to make sure that we are living with the end in mind. In other words, making sure that we're focused on the right things, not today's thing. That we're focusing on the future of where God wants us to be and what God wants us to do, not focusing on all of the trials and all of the situations that we are faced with today. And I want to point you to a passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, Paul writing this passage, sitting in prison, by the way, In AD 68, sitting in the Mamertine prison outside of Rome, knowing that very soon that he would be led to a place, the the Ostian Way outside of Rome, where he would be beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. That he would pay the ultimate price for his faith. That he would be executed because he believed in and he proclaimed the truth of God's word, that he proclaimed the gospel, that he stood up for Christ. He wrote these words in that situation. Those are important things to remember when you read these words and understanding what it is that Paul said to know where he wrote them from and and the kind of situation that he was facing as he wrote these words. I read this to you today. In verse six, it says, for I, Paul writing, I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Verse eight says, finally, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who loved his appearing. Now, think about that passage for a moment. 
Think about where Paul was writing these words. Literally bind time until the moment that he would be led out of that dungeon where he was being kept and led out of that place and, and walked out to the Austrian way and there he would be beheaded that he would be executed for his faith and executed for following Christ. Nero had made it illegal to be a Christian. And so he knew that he was about to pay the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate price for his faith in Christ. And yet here he writes the words, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. And then he says that one word that blows my mind. He says this, finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. I'm about to be killed for what I believe. And it's almost as if he's writing these words excited for what lies ahead. You know why? You know why he could say that? Because Paul was living with the end in mind. He wasn't fixed on what was happening today. And so from this passage and from Paul's writing, I, I want to share with you just four quick thoughts of how we today, how we can live like that, of how we can seek Micah 6, 8 in our lives Today, even in the culture that tells us that that is wrong, that we shouldn't do that, that we should seek what the world thinks is important, I want to share with you today four quick thoughts of, of how we can make sure from what Paul wrote here that we can do just as he did. And the first one is this, is to make sure that we live this out, is we have to keep our eyes fixed on tomorrow's destination, not today's desperation. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on where we're going, not what we're suffering in today. Look what Paul wrote in this passage. In verse 7, I fought the good fight. And man, he had fought it. He'd been in jail. He'd been in prison. He'd been beaten. He'd been left for dead. He'd done all those things. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Verse 8, finally, finally, he says, finally, I've arrived. Finally, I, I get to experience the, the, the results, the payoff, the, the payday for what I've been doing, for how I've been living, for, for where I've been going. Finally, I get to experience what I have been telling you about, he writes. And he writes this while he's sitting in a, a prison where he's about to be executed. Finally, Paul facing the greatest challenge in his life, but yet he kept his eyes fixed on where he was going. That's the greatest lesson for each and every one of us in this room. For those of us who claim Christ, for those of us who believe that, that Jesus died and rose again, for those of us, according to Romans chapter 10, who, who have confessed with our lips and believed in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he was raised from the dead, that he and he alone is the answer to everything that we could ever experience, that Jesus is, John chapter 14, verse 6, that he is the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. That if we believe that, those of us who embrace that, that we know no matter what it is that we face today, God has victory in store for us in the days ahead. That God's got an amazing plan for us. That even on this earth, if we face the greatest of trials and the greatest of tribulations, and even if we, like Paul, get to the place where we lose it all because of our faith, God says, don't, don't, don't worry about that. I got that covered because I've got a place like Revelation 21 that talks about, that says, I've got a place where there, there's no more pain and there is no more sorrow and there are no more tears and there is no more death, a place of eternal joy, a place where all the old stuff that you battle with and the stuff that you are embraced with today that, that gives you great sorrow and great suffering, all that stuff, it passes away and everything is made New, You see, God tells us, I've got this in store for you. And when you keep your eyes fixed on what is tomorrow, what's happening today is not that big of a deal anymore. In another one of Paul's writings, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he writes it this way. Verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race, they all run, but only one receives the prize, he says. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Run to win, he says. But listen to what he says in verse 25. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they, 
those who are running the race alongside you, in other words, for us today, those who are living this life and, and walking the, the same road, the same journey that we're walking today, it says, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. Oh, but listen, but we for an imperishable crown. In other words, we're running the race for a totally different reason. We're not running for the accolades today. We're not running for the fame today. We're not running for the power today. We're not running for the money today. No, no, no. We are running for something that is far more valuable, that which God has in store for us when we embrace His way for our lives. Yesterday, I was in Baltimore, Maryland. I was up visiting with Ellis Prince, who is one of our Liberty graduates and, and one of our Thomas Road Church planters, planted a church there about six years ago. And we're talking about some different things that are happening there, but over these last six years, he was sharing with me that how he went there, he went with just a couple of people to plant a church. He planted Gallery Church there in Baltimore, and man, he faced incredible trials every single day when he planted that church. Going through difficult moments, difficult time, trying to find the money and the resources to continue to do what he does, uh, trying to, to figure out what he was going to do tomorrow and how he's going to make it even through the first month, not uh, no less the, the, the first year, how he's going to keep going. And then even people who, who led uh, denominations and led other churches, led other organizations that were supposedly trying to help him, and they came to him and said, you know what, you're not doing a good enough job, so we're cutting our money off. We're not going to give you any more money because we don't think you're doing a good enough job. And so he was left in a time when, when really he was there all by himself. And even those people who were supposed to be standing with him planting that church walked away. And he told me yesterday, he said, you know what, I believe that those times that I went through, it was nothing more than a test that God was given to me. It, it was literally God testing me to see, are you going to trust me? Is that song that L.U. Praise did an incredible job sharing with us today. Are you going to trust me even when the world walks out? And today, Ellis not only leads a, a great church in downtown Baltimore in the Inner Harbor where they have over 500 people that are there in six years in the middle of downtown, but they also have now numerous locations that are meeting throughout Baltimore. And he has a vision, and God is actually implementing that vision where just a few days ago, he received a check from an organization to help him carry out this vision, a check for $200,000 to help him plant 250 churches throughout the entire region of Baltimore to reach every neighborhood. And I believe firmly that Ellis is a great picture of when the world walks out, when you are standing there all by yourself, just as Paul wrote, we are not running for the accolades of man today. We are running the race to win the, the, the trust of God, of doing what it is that God called us to do. Keep your eyes fixed on tomorrow's destination, not today's desperation. The second thing in this passage that we need to make sure that we apply in our lives if we're actually going to live with the end in mind, is this, is that we always need to go against the tide, not run with it. Always go against the tide, not with it. He wrote those words to fight the good fight, that regardless of what the world says, regardless of what even your friends say, to make sure that you're always going in the right direction, not in the world's direction. Making sure that you're always traveling the road that God lays out for you, not what the world says you ought to do. And Paul in Philippians chapter 2, he wrote these words in verse 15, make sure that you live so that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Paul wrote these words to tell us, man, make sure that you live a life that is blameless, live a life that people can look at and they can see something different something that is different. You see, when we live just like the world does, when we live exactly like that, guess what happens? When the world looks at us to see something different, they see exactly what they see in the mirror every day, and we never have the opportunity to bring them to a realization of who Christ is. Let me just let you in on a little secret. Anybody can run with the crowd. Anybody can, can run with the, the, the people that are going the wrong direction. The, the scriptures talk about broad is the way that leads to destruction. Anybody can do that. But only a few can stand up. Only a few can actually be brave enough, courageous enough to take the word of God at its faith, face value and believe what it says, to have faith in what God gives to them and stand up against the crowd and go the right direction. Broad's the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to life. Be a person who goes against the grain. 
Be the kind of person that no matter if everyone else around you is trying to take you in the wrong direction, that you just stand up and say, listen, I'm a follower of Christ and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the right thing. When we make sure that we live like that, when we make sure that that is our focus, man, we're going to stand out as different. We're going to stand out as being someone that, that, that people know that there's something different about them. And I promise you that what they're going to see that is different about them, uh, you, if you're doing that, if they're going to see Christ in you. Which, by the way, isn't that exactly what we're supposed to be in the first place? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, you need to stand up and be counted and be recognized as someone who follows me. The third thing we've got to get, if we're going to truly live out this faith the way that we're intended, if we're going to live with the end in mind is this, is always be encouraged by the victory promised, not the defeat experienced. The, the, the one thing I can assure you is this. I don't care how great things are going today. I don't care if everything in your life is, is perfect, man. You're on a mountaintop right now and, and you're just experiencing one of the greatest moments, the greatest experiences in your life. I promise you this, that everyone who is in this room will face great trial and great challenge sometime in the days ahead. My dad always said it this way. He said, you're either in trouble, you just came out of trouble, or you'll get the phone call tomorrow. That all of us live in a time where we're going to face difficult moments. And what happens is sometimes when we're going through the valley experiences, we get so focused on all of the trials that we're going through today that we forget that God's already promised us the victory that lies ahead. In this passage in verse 8, Paul writing those words, Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. There's no doubt that Paul was facing today one of the greatest challenges that, that any of us could ever even imagine going through of sitting in a prison knowing that your death is imminent, that you will be executed any moment, that it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next week, you have no idea when it is that they're going to come and, and pull you out of that, that dungeon and take you out and kill you for what you believe. And here he is writing, finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. You know why? Because Paul knew that God had already promised him the victory. He wasn't focused on the defeat that he was facing today. And when he was sitting in that prison, man, there's no question, that's a defeat. He didn't intend to be in prison. He didn't want to be in prison. He wasn't looking to try to get arrested and be taken off to jail. That's not what he wanted. It's not what he desired. But when he got there, it didn't matter. He still kept his eyes fixed on Christ. I saw not, uh, not long ago, of making sure that we're you know, talking about keeping the, uh, the eyes fixed on the, the victory that's promised rather than the defeat we're facing today. Adrian Brody, who's an actor, won an Oscar a few years ago. And there were, people were talking to him because he came out literally out of almost nowhere where nobody had ever seen him before. And here he is now winning an Oscar and, and at the top of his game, the top of his career, and the top of his field. And people were celebrating who he is, talking about the fact, man, how in the world did you become an overnight success? And he said this. He said, you know, my dad always told me that it takes 15 years to become an overnight success. My problem is it took me 17 and a half. You see, Adrian spent 17 and a half years working to try to accomplish what he was trying to accomplish. And there are some of you in this room today that you've got your mind already fixed. You know exactly what it is that you want to do. You're studying for that right now, that career, that path, whatever it is that you want to do and however it is what you want to serve the rest of your life. And you just know that this is it. And this is what I'm going to do. And man, I want to be successful. Man, just always remember, you're not going to walk out of Liberty University when you graduate and you're going to be at the top of the field. If you're going into politics, you're not going to you know, end up graduating from liberty in the next year, run for president and win. It doesn't happen like that. It takes being focused on the fact that we have a victory that is promised in the days ahead that we have to work for today. Paul understood that. Last thing. We understand that we keep our eyes fixed on tomorrow's destination, not today's desperation. We, we, we know that we have to to recognize that we must be encouraged in the victory that we're promised, not in the defeat that we're facing. But the last thing is we've got to make sure we do, and this is where most of us fail, where most of us fall by the wayside. And so I want you to hear real clearly what, what Paul writes here, because the last thing that we make sure we understand is this, is that you must never quit no matter how tough the task. No matter how difficult it might seem, don't quit. Don't give up. 
Don't throw in the towel. Anyone can do that. Anyone can quit when they're facing difficult moments. Quitting is the easiest thing to do. When it gets tough, you just simply walk away. But my friends today, you will not know this, you will never become a leader by quitting. You don't aspire to greatness by being known as a quitter. You don't get to the top of your field by being a person who quits when things get difficult. You don't ever accomplish all the dreams that you've had since the time you were a little kid when you get to a place when you're facing a challenge and you say, you know what, this isn't worth the fight. You will never be successful if you are a person who is willing to quit. There's no doubt about it. When you look at the life of Paul, here's a guy that, man, he would, he would never quit. No matter what it was, whether he was being beaten, whether he was being shipwrecked, whether he was being criticized, whether he was being mocked, whether he was being thrown in jail, whether he was about to be executed throughout his entire ministry, throughout every moment from the time that, that, that Christ was revealed to him, he never gave up no matter how tough the road was. If you want to make sure that you live with the end in mind, if you want to make sure that you live out Micah 6, 8, man, make sure you never quit. When Paul wrote that word, finally, let that word be a, a testimony of your life. That one day, many, many years from now, when you come near the end of your life and you've done all the things that God's called you to do, when you've tried to accomplish all the things that, that, that God has laid on your heart, when you have worked faithfully and diligently and you have said, I will not quit. I will keep on going. I will keep on moving. I will do what God has called me to do. Make sure that when you get to that place that you can actually write that same word, finally, because I fought the good fight. Finally, because I kept the faith. Finally, because I stayed the course, because I traveled the road that God laid before me. And when things got tough, I didn't, I didn't quit. I didn't walk away. I didn't give up. No, I stayed with it. So now, finally, I've reached the place where I'll receive the great reward. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul writes, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind as if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this even to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. He said, let us be together in this. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and, belly and whose glory is in their shame. And that passage right there is a picture of those three aspirations the world says are important, fame, power, money. It says here, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on what? On the earthly things. Paul writes, for our citizenship is not here, it's in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to the glorious body according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. Paul writes, don't focus on what the world says is important. Focus on the things above. Focus on the things that are of Christ. Don't focus on what the world tells you you've got to have. Don't focus on the things that the world says are are valuable. Don't focus on what the world says are a success story. No, 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 no. What do you do? Micah 6, 8. That the Lord has told you what is right, what you should do, what you've got to focus on. Be a person of justice, of doing what's right no matter what. When the world tells you to do the wrong thing, you say, no, 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 because I'm a follower of Christ. I will do that which is right. Be a lover of mercy of kindness, of faithfulness, a person that no matter how uh, tough a situation might be, that, that people will, can always count on you because they see mercy in the way that you live as an example of Christ. And then lastly, to walk humbly with your God. Friends, as you come to the end of a semester, as some of you come to the end of a, 
of, of a college experience. Always remember, the things of God are what lead to success. The things of the world are always what lead to destruction. Let us make a commitment. We're going to be people who no matter what, I will follow him. Would you pray with me? Father, today, I thank you for the love that you've showed to us. I thank you for the example that you've set for us. When we talk about humility, there's no question about it, that you set the ultimate example of humility when you laid down your life for us. When you died a death that you didn't deserve to die, that you did that for us because you loved us that much. When we talk about humility, we talk about justice, we talk about mercy. God, you are the perfect example of that. God, help us to live likewise. God, help us to walk with you and walk towards you. God, help us to honor you in all that we do. God, help us to be an example of that kind of, of Christ-likeness in everything. Help us to live out Matthew 22 of loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, souls, mind, and strength. And loving our neighbors as ourselves. God, I pray for every person in this room. That regardless of where they are today and regardless of where they go tomorrow, God, that they would be a people that never try to be successful in the world's view. That they will be a people who focus on success in God's view. Lord, help us to walk humbly with you. And God, for that, we give you the praise. We give you the glory for what you have done, for what you are doing, and for what you are yet to do for each of us today. In Jesus' name we pray.